I found um, hello. I I found Steve Levin on um, on YouTube. Okay. Oh yeah, there's lots of him there. Yeah. Yeah. But that's still probably not going to help me with uh, some of these things. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is that great. called? A uh, unifying framework for... <laughs> you read it? <laughs> I didn't read it. I tried. I couldn't see the whole thing. But... Okay. A, a unifying framework for form finding and topology finding and segregate structures. Okay. Um, and that goes with a structure stiffness matrix based computational mechanics method of epithelial monolayers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds uh, like a... Yeah, no, that, it, it goes with the paper I've been trying to work off of. Uh, where is that? Anyway. 3D continuum models for of uh, tensegrity mod modulus with the effect of self stress. Uh, that's a follow up paper. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. I'm, yeah. yeah. That, this is. Oh, here it is. Equivalent mechanical properties of tensegrity truss structures with self stress included. Trying to figure that paper out. I, I, yeah. Yeah, that one, you start reading it, it makes sense until you get into the middle of it and it's like you left half of it out. <laughs> I don't know, there's uh, elasticity and, just, and shear stress. And you, I don't know whether that's the elasticity and shear stress of the whole thing. And you have to measure it. Yeah. I think that's what you do, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, leave out the, the parameters and just just assume that. Just assume that. Yeah, don't, don't tell me how you got the parameters. <laughs> you know what you're doing with them. And you're doing, and then don't exactly explain uh, the programming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can maybe figure that out. It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh well. well. We'll hope he has some clue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, it's a, it's a very good topic, but uh, and it, it maybe does need to be included in what I'm doing, but it's um <clears throat> very frustrating. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is probably means it's a good topic for a grad student. Like that's my experience. Like. If you can't find anything on it, or if you don't understand the stuff you find on it, and it's complicated to begin with, and nobody sorted it out, it's a grad student's thing. Yeah, yeah, it's usually. <laughs> okay, Susan, I, I just sent you and Bradley a list of papers on oxetic tensegrity. On which? Oxetic tensegrity. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I got the I got the papers yesterday. Okay, okay. nice. Um, yeah, uh, one of the papers, one of the examples in, in the thing I'm trying to sort out is oxetic, and bone is oxetic. Actually, is the most living um, tensegrities are, but I know bone is oxetic for sure. What is oxetic? It, it when you when you um, push on it it shrinks like okay. it does the opposite to it has a negative plus Hans ratio. Okay. And it, it yeah, does I, the opposite to what you think. I watched the interview with uh, between Steve and Flemings, and uh, it's interesting, but I'm afraid it's not convincing. <laughs> Uh, Stephen, who? 
Steve Levin and Tom Clemens. It's in, it, it's in the list I just sent you, in case you don't have it. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, what is that about? Uh, things like dinosaur necks, why they don't fall off. My dinosaur legs not fall off? No, no, next, next. Oh, next. I, uh. Okay. <laughs> of course, we don't know the dinosaur didn't drag their necks on the ground. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them swam, so that's, that's cheating. Right. right. <laughs> but uh, the classical picture showed them with their necks way up in the air. Yeah, yeah. And the Disney pictures. So they're like giraffes? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's I guess that's the claim, yes. They're, uh, okay. they're like uh, Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Oh, okay. <laughs> no <what> feathers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the terror movies. <laughs> I can attest to it myself. Uh, I had I had a problem for a short while where I couldn't lift my head. And boy, it's, my head is heavy. It's incredibly heavy. <laughs> when you try to lift your own head. <laughs> and, you, and the muscles aren't working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I guess my authentic system was out of whack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your tension elements. <laughs> My tension elements. At any rate, uh, I'd like to see proof, like changing some of the tension elements, and then, the, then the dinosaur falls over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so get a pet dinosaur. Yeah. I <laughs> think <laughs> they're called chickens. <laughs> Or geese. Okay, I, I have to reinstall my browser so I'm going to disappear for a minute. Okay. I will. Morphing matter, that was it. Okay. The morphing matter meetings? Did you? Uh, I don't know if that's the same one that I went to, but I went to one on Monday and Tuesday. It was in Paris. It was hosted in Paris. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. But uh, it may be the same oh. one. Yeah. The morphing matter one was, I don't think it was in Paris, but I'm not not sure. Okay. <laughs> and it was Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I got to see Monday and Wednesday and was very upset that I had to miss Tuesday, so I just wondered if either of you had attended it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> That's the same okay. meeting I'm thinking of, but... It's called it was morphing, uh, morphing matter. Okay. Yeah, I don't. That's I don't. It's off now. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the topics that they had when you went? Um. Okay. Let me find that. Um. Let's see. Uh, okay. Physics. Of morphing matter, December twelfth to fourteenth. Okay. Topics were active algorithms for morphable matter, um, reconfiguring meta structures from wave control to mechano intelligence, shape morphing, morphing and chirality switching, directed by spatially encoded liquid crystal elastomer microparticles. Inflatable morphing matter using uh, biohybrid robotics to understand structure function relationships of the heart. Uh, computational design of soft functional composite structures and robots. And liquids and elasticity. And then I missed mechanics guided 3D assembly. And multi-shape, multi-step shape morphing. So I'm upset about some of this. Yeah. Uh, do you have the website, like the the program? Um, uh, it's PC 
ts.princeton.edu. Can I copy that? Yeah, okay. All right. I'll try and put this in the chat. Okay. Um, anyway, it, it was very interesting, and I discovered a way of, of checking out the um, blastocele of... Oh, wow, okay. I'll be developing a salamander egg using console um, from the one of the talks. Um, and I can do it in real life using uh, dental material. So yeah. it, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, okay, it was that and physics of morphing matter. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, They're not going to be recording the talk, so, but they have a poster and some other things here. All right. Yeah, yeah. that looks great. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, uh, it was, um, I think I'm going to follow through and, and make some of these. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a great series of topics. Uh, uh, there's the agenda. Let's see. There's a... Uh, yeah, they have a whole agenda here. Uh, yeah, this shape morphing was really interesting because uh, I went to another conference during that same time where they talked about uh, some of the work people were doing with inflating different, like building balloons or some sort of inflatable structures that you can actually mimic morphogenesis with. So you can actually mimic like the plant body or, or things that are uh, taking shape and development. And you can look at the structural uh, stability and, and how they kind of unfold, how they move, how they buckle and then go in. Oh, well, this was... Uh... Like they made, he made a hand that did this. Oh wow! By inflating it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's just like you know, you build a little analog where you're, it, there's there's no there's no tissue. It's just the idea that this inflatable is roughly sort of the same has the same dynamics and well, shows what's possible in terms of folding. Or yeah. Oh, <laughs> my phone. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, anyways, um, if you wanted me to um, show you some of that, I yeah, that'd be I great. Yeah, um, why don't you try? Somebody said he's from Amazon customer service. Um, hang up. Yeah. <laughs> Any call like that is uh. Because uh, Amazon does not call people. No, and um, I, uh, I, I'm bad with them. Usually, I just leave. I <clears throat> leave them. I go hello, 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 and then I just put <laughs> it there, and I wait until it it uh, automatically hangs up on them. So I've wasted their time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. You're going to start calling you collect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, try to find it in here, but there's um, all kinds of interesting things. And there's things on branching structures. Um, yeah, I, it was very, very good. I wish they had recorded it and... They said they weren't going to record it. Yeah. So I I, I don't know why they wouldn't have, but um, maybe people are fussy. Yeah. Sometimes they don't go off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't expect to to show this really, um, but I, it is it is worth 
worthwhile showing. Yeah. People playing with toys and stuff. Um, <laughs> maybe you need to wait until I found it. <laughs> oh, here's the here's the um, here it is. Uh, I think part of yeah. These are inflatable structures. Um, let's see if I can. Can I share screen? Yeah, yeah, you should be able to. Uh, at the bottom. There you go. Okay, there we go. There, can you see? So um, these are inflatable structures here, and they've actually calculated um, how they inflate. Um, they've made them out of triangles. You carefully went over this. They've made them out of triangles. Right. And they've built them, and they've found out how how that uh, how they work, and they've plotted where they will properly inflate and where they won't. Great. So it's kind of neat. And then they made made a, that sort of bridge structure, and then they built it there, and it inflates, and they made a, another inflatable. Um, oh, these are still three-dimensional structures, okay. Yeah, three-dimensional structures, sort of organic. So they did that. Um, oh, maybe this, no, that's the heart. This was good about the heart. A heart is a, um, a sort of a sigmoid shape. It's a, it's not a, uh, not a hollow. It's more of a, a wrapped, wrapped piece. So they <laughs> showing toilet paper. <laughs> it's a wrapped muscle. Okay. So so that was good. And then they made artificial jellyfish. Like this is an artificial jellyfish that they made. And it, it works. Um, <laughs> and then they made um, an artificial uh, stingray. Oh, wow. Okay. A little stingray that they made. There it is. Here it is. And, and then they got it to swim. Oh, well, it, this doesn't show up very well, but um, it has magnets in it, and they got it to swim around obstacles. Okay. Yeah. So then they were ready. They made kind of a ventricle of the heart with a fish vehicle. A fish vehicle. Yeah, a fish yeah. vehicle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he made a, a skeleton of a heart and <laughs> put um, rat myocardiites in it and um, get pumped. And they found out you had to make the spirals um, not just straight across, but at an angle, or else it didn't pump the way it should. And then they made a fish that swam. Um, here's the fish. And uh, I don't know, the guy said he visited aquariums. So maybe that's why, why yeah. all of that. <laughs> anyway, and they're working on, on making the whole heart, actually. So yeah. that was good. And then this this is the next one. Um, this is oh, and this, this wrinkles like this because of the way the materials are laid out. Oh yeah. You go back up a little bit to stimulus response hydrogels. Is that what this is? Uh, I think the yeah. last page. Um, yeah. It actually works as a gripper um, okay. if you make it like this. I was more interested in, oh, there's tubes in our body like some of these things. 
So they go from this to, to that. And they they will bend as well. So they're, they're making um, uh, objects that move. And they got us um, this line uh, inchworm thing to to move as well. And they were showing movies of it. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And then it it goes up like this and, and moves. And they um, discovered it was the um, middle part here uses friction to to push it along. Okay. If it's up in mid air, it doesn't go anywhere. But if it has contact with the surface, it moves. So they made an inchworm. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting question with diatoms. They are rigid. They're not, not like that inchworm. Uh, but uh, can they swim in water anyway? Yes. Well, and here's the there here's their gripper. They're making the gripper. It's a star and it and, and folds. Ah, and then we get into the next one, um, and this is this is the uh, I think this is the one that I liked so much. Um, yeah, yeah, there it is. See, it's um, it's straight, and then you turn on uh, you you inflate it, and it it picks up a blackberry. <laughs> and this is the shape. There, this is what intrigued me. This he puts uh, the dental material into a tube, and then he puts um, air in it, and it makes this shape. That's because the air rises um, to the top and floats. So, hmm. <laughs> and so I was uh, kind of interested in that. Okay. Then it's a liquid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you put air in it, it bends because there's air here and not here and it's unequal and it so you have a bending structure. It's under under air under pressure. How much pressure? Um hmm, I I don't know that he said. Okay. But he, there's the there's a bunch of different um Outlines of tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Mm. I was interested huh? <laughs> in the shape. And so one could get a sphere and, and bubble cast a uh, salamander egg, a pretend salamander egg. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. I don't know how much worth it that is, but. Anyway, um, this is um, this is the experiment using these um, these things, and it's really neat. You can put these on the end of another one, and these these wrinkle and take hold of whatever that is, and then lift. She made a grab and hold and pull, and these fingers. Fingers here curl. Okay. And thickness, they curl at different times due to the thickness of the material. Yeah. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, it was quite something. And, of course, they, they made things that, that move and, and curl. So, yeah. Yeah. And then this... Yeah. Deployable structures. So the next one, the next one was deployable structures. And it's uh, like an insect um, coming out of a chrysalis and it goes this way. And it'll inflate only and inflate like this only if it's got a cover on it. Like just a balloon uh, doesn't do that. You have to put some sort of a, a stretchable 
um, cover on it. What is this figure here with the balloon animal and the trees, the branching structures? So this is the balloon animals. And you can, if you coat the, the balloon, you get this sort of thing happening and the whole structure inflates. Oh. But if you have a balloon, it, it, it spends its, its uh, inflation as, uh, to get larger instead of actually moving the whole structure. So. Uh, okay. So if you coat it, what do you mean by coat it? Like... Um, coat, well, this is coated with um, sort of a rubbery tape. Oh, okay. Like, I guess you can get them for, uh, <clears throat> for, for wounds in the drugstore. You can get tape like that, this sort of an elastic tape. You put right. an elastic tape around the balloon end, and it, um, and it elongates. Whereas oh. if you have a balloon, it just blows up. Yeah. So you, you get this sort of behavior if you've taped the balloon. So you take the balloon, you take the tape, and you get this, and and you put pressure under it, and it'll do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you can get, this is a pretend wing, and it inflates. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, and then he made this thing that looks like a spider and actually becomes a dome. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, <laughs> oh, well, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was the last one. Okay. The whole thing was was interesting and I, I missed, t missed, what was it, um, Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, it often happens. I try to attend these things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Uh, All yeah. right. That, that was my find okay. last. No, I'm running behind, so I'm going to quit now. Okay. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Uh oh. All right. Well. Yeah. <laughs> He's running behind. Yeah, I guess he has some other yeah. meetings he has to make. Uh, oh. So, yeah, I was going to go over some things that I... Uh, I, oh, I, went to I some, wanted to uh, show him that. Just... Oh. You could send us... Could you send us those notes? Like, uh, the document? It looks like you have a Word doc. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can send you the Word doc and... Um, yeah, their announcement. I just found it on the Dsoft uh, APS. Like they keep me informed. Like the, um, APS Physics. Yeah. I became a member and I'm going to attend their March meeting again because I found it so useful. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, especially since I'm a student and it doesn't like cost a hundred bucks or something. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then I don't have to go to Chicago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can still have my computer. It's not as not as good because I don't see the, all of the things I want to see. But I got to see enough. Like you can't see everything at a conference anyway. So yeah, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So yeah, I have a, a bunch of things actually to to go through. I, ha I went to two meetings last week and they were during this time that you're the meeting you just showed was but the second the meeting that i talked about nemo devo is actually had some very similar topics to this so i'm going to go through a little bit of that and show okay uh, let me share my screen see i was like last week i was busy i had like two conferences i attended i didn't present at them but uh, I don't know if this is going to share. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen here? I see a blank screen, yeah. <laughs> oh, there. Okay, great. <clears throat> so,
So uh, first thing I want to talk about was this new video on the DevoWorm YouTube channel. This is on embryo networks and computational development. So this is about an hour long talk that summarizes a lot of the work that's been done on the group on embryo networks and some of the network structures uh, that we've written papers on and things like that. So it kind of goes over the last five years of that work. I guess it's been about five years. So this, this is, goes into this idea of embryo networks, which are where you have cells or things within cells that form networks. And you can build embryo networks. So you can build network models of the embryo at different points in development. You can build uh, connectomes, which are where you model neurons in the nervous system. And you can build other types of networks that are, you know, have other functions. So that's on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's available for viewing. Is it's on YouTube? Yeah. Oh. Devaworm has a YouTube channel, uh, but you can go to the uh, website devaworm.weebly.com and Medium Public Lectures. So we have a Medium Public Lectures channel, which has a bunch Devo of lectures. Uh, sorry, is it on there? Yeah, it's, it's up in the, yeah. Okay, I just don't see it. Uh, Divaworm.weebly.com. I'll put a link in the chat here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see. And then there, at that website, there's a... So at that website, there's a link uh, to media and public lectures. And so that will give you the link. This will give you this page where we have a bunch of different videos from different conferences and venues. Uh, I think that's the wrong picture for that. That's it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So those are all available. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this. This was, uh, so Mayuk Deb, of course, worked with us uh, two years ago on Google Summer of Code, and he has been a maintainer with the Devil Learn uh, platform. And so he recently wrote an article in The Gradient, which is a uh, Machine learning, uh, it's like kind of a popular journal. It's, uh, you know, they publish articles every maybe two weeks on different topics of machine learning. And so he, he's been, uh, he is finally able to get his article out. So Mayuk has been active uh, doing things with his startup, Aleph Aleph. So he's been working on neural networks there and he's been doing other things. So he's been, he's been a success story of our. Uh, Google Summer of Code uh, program in the group. Wow. Yeah, and he wrote this article, uh, Learning to Make the Right Mistakes, a brief comparison between human perception and multimodal uh, learning machines. And so this is a nice article, kind of goes over some of his thoughts on, uh, you know, looking at like machine learning models and human perception. So he's looking at things like bottom up and top down processing. Uh, you know, multimodal language models, which are these uh, this class of models where they, if you've heard of large language models, uh, that's kind of what they are, but multimodal language models are uh, predict, like, if you give it a, a prompt, it gives you a text string that can be predicted. There are these next token predictors, which is the mechanism behind a lot of these models. So GPT-3 is a large language model and uh, multimodal language models are an attempt to make such language models perceive the world in a way that's one step closer to humans. So you can, you know, if you have something like a ResNet 
or a GPT Neo, those are specialized for vision or language, but not both. And so if you use a ResNet and you give it visual information, like a database of images, you can use it to predict the ResNet to predict the images, and then the large language model to predict the, the text or the word strings. And you can have a multimodal model where you have images and words and, and merging that together. So this is an example here where you have a picture of a bird and you encode the image and then you have this string which is this as a so it could be potentially like a description of the bird or some other semantic information. Use a text tokenizer to, and then this forms together, this forms an embedding and then this goes to a pre-trained language model and then there's an output and it classifies it as a bird. So this image is classified and this really kind of, you know, uh, maybe solves the problem a bit of the semantic content of images. Um, so this is really interesting. And he kind of just kind of goes through this and considers, you know, what you can do with this technology. Um, and then comparing it with like convolutional neural networks and other things like that. So he's got a lot of, and then he has some closing words. So you check that out. It's a nice article he wrote. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about are these um, models that uh, comes up. Actually, I'll start here. Uh, these are called soda constructor models, and these are pretty old, actually. Uh, I remember playing with them about 15 years ago. Uh, they're these physics models that are like they have these points and these struts. And the idea is that these points are weight masses or or just mass uh, point masses. And then these struts are springs. And you can see the little dots in here, which are the springs. And what you can do is you can build models uh, with points and, and struts. And, you know, you can build them in a way that forms these kind of walkers. So, you know, they uh, at one time, there was this uh, tool called Soda Constructor. And Soda Constructor was a very popular uh, platform to build your own models on. And they had tournaments where people would build models that would do all sorts of things. They had walkers like this, and they had different types of models that, you know, would uh, twirl around and locomote in all sorts of interesting ways and move around in these physics simulations. So it's a standard physics simulation. It's a very simple physics simulation, but it has these basic elements. And what you can do with these models is you can uh, set a number of parameters on these. So the simulation is basically having these points in space, having these springs that, or spring masses that join between them, these struts, and then you're able to simulate them with a force. And so this is a this spring, you can play around with this, this sidebar, which shows these little spring masses are at a certain frequency. If you play around with them a little bit, you can get it to do different things. So it's slowed down a little bit. All right, now I touched it and it start move, It starts to move it, moved up in the air. And now it's kind of walking weird, a little bit more. Uh, the gate is a little bit different. So you can play around with the parameters like that. And so it's a really interesting tool. Now, Soda Constructor has been um, <clears throat> off the internet for a while, but people have built, the code is open source, <clears throat> and you can build your own constructor platform. So this is Open Constructor. Uh, this is by uh, Peter Feidelman. Uh, and, you know, he's kind of revived the Soda Constructor code and, and put up a little interface for that. There's this other one called Constructor in German, I guess. And this is uh, actually a, it works the same way. You have this uh, walker and you have the the point masses and you have the forces acting on it and you can do different things with it. Uh, so where would you find that? Do you have a uh, website? Or yeah, so there's this, this website here, which is, uh, let me see if I can put it in the chat here. That's the one. And then the open constructor is this other 
instructor software. So we have these two kinds of these two interfaces. So I was thinking about this in terms of tensegrity structures too. So there's a I have a bunch of files here uh, on different things that you can do with them, and uh, I have, for example, a set of parameters that uh, might be useful. And we were talking about these uh, tensegrity networks in particular. And these kind of structures in the underlying code might be useful for sort of building tensegrity networks. So uh, this screenshot I have here is, uh, this is actually of a different thing. It's a genetic car, which is built on the same principle. That's not really useful in this context, but it shows you that, uh, yeah, so this is my search on soda constructor here where you have, uh, this is the actual, it was released in 2000, and it was a Java-based physics engine. So this is something that was invented by Ed Burton, who was an artist, and it, it, it was very popular back in the aughts. But you had this model, it's very much like a, a tensegrity model. This is the code, uh, or it's, it's actually pretty simple. You have a gravity parameter, which defines the specific gravity you have the number of nodes in your network, so 10 points. And then you have all these springs, and you have these values for the springs, which are sort of the, I guess, the dense, or the, the, uh, the physical, uh, I guess, the passiveness of the spring. And then that's all you really need. And then you can define that and build your model. Uh, there's this article. It's an interview with Ed Burton. It's evolving out of the virtual mud. This talks about the different types of soda constructors that people had built over the years. There's all this, uh, you know, these walkers and different types of spinning structures and things like that. Uh, there's also this, uh, what is this one? Oh, this is soda constructor physics. This is actually an activity for, this is actually an educational uh, tutorial for, I guess, high school students. It's pretty easy because you can build these soda constructors pretty easily, uh, and it just demonstrates some of the creatures. So you know you can build them like kind of like vehicles, kind of like almost like consecutive like networks. That would have been very useful when I was trying to teach computer science, and all I had was a robot and an old computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would have been, it would have been a good project. Yeah. And it just shows kind of these physical principles and how, you know, the these these physics work. So um, then I I remember I post I did a blog post a while back I think it was probably about seven or eight years ago where uh, I had highlighted these what they call strand beasts and so this is uh, uh, Theo Jansen, who's a Dutch artist, kinetic sculptor, and he builds these huge uh, sculptures of these creatures, and he calls them um, strand beasts, with, or, which are beach beasts. He runs them on the beach in the Netherlands. This is in the city. But basically, they, they're, they're the same type of structure as the soda play uh, or the soda constructor uh, creatures, but they actually walk, and their physical models are not in a computer. So you've used these same uh, principles uh, to build these things. Um, and some of these creatures even have a stomach without conventional animal muscles. So he's able to articulate structures in the animal or in the made up animal without muscles. So this is interesting. And then uh, this is, uh, I guess, the wing and bottle propelled stomach of this organism, you know, animal. It's not an organism, it's a model. They gave it a, a Latin uh, species name and, and genus name. And then this is, uh, so this is the structure here. And it's a lot like some of the structures that we've talked about with respect to some of these uh, soft active matter models. Uh, and then this is a kinetic sculpture here. This is a simulated strand beast. And then um, this is an example of the model. This is an approximation of quadrupedal gait in strand beasts. So this kind of shows how this works. 
a little bit different than the soda constructor uh, soda play uh, models because it's a little bit more complex, but still it works. It, it demonstrates some of these principles. So that's, uh, you know, that was uh, the stuff I put together for that. I think this one is, uh, this article is something that I'm, oh, oh this is a lecture, Darwin, Darwinism on a Desktop. So to play in the evolution of a digital world. So this is something Ed Burton uh, delivered in 2005. Uh, it was a lecture on some of this stuff. So there's a strong tie-in with uh, Darwinian evolution and some of these things that are being built. You know, there's a lot of variation in these designs. And, you know, being able to construct them based on just kind of function is re really interesting stuff that emerges from this. So that brings me to what the actual things that I attended last week, which were actually uh, two things. So the first thing was this Learning on Graphs conference. And this was a, a interesting conference on graph neural networks. And I know last summer we did some things on um, graph neural networks in GSOC, and we've now incorporated that into the Devo, uh, the Devo Learn repository. So if you want to check out uh, what we did, last summer with respect to this, go to uh, the GitHub organization for DevoLearn and look at the DevoGraph repository. The DevoGraph repository has a lot of that software in it. Uh, it hasn't been incorporated into a release of DevoLearn, but that's that's coming um, maybe in, in the new year. So there's this Learning on Graphs conference. This is a really good conference. It went over a lot of things with respect to graph neural networks machine learning on graphs, and geometry. And so it's really, it was really interesting talks. It was all live streamed on YouTube. The, uh, the uh, lectures are available on this live stream. So if you go to their uh, YouTube channel, it's uh, there. They also had some tutorials, which I did not attend, but I think they'll be also putting those up on YouTube eventually. So the, there's some tutorials on how to build graph neural networks using like a, a collab notebook. So if you want to follow along, you can, uh, you know, if you know how to use collab notebooks, you can follow along with the tutorials and you can build your own graph neural networks. There were some really interesting talks. Uh, a lot of it was overlap with uh, uh, the NeurIPS conference, which is the conference, main conference for machine learning and deep learning. Uh, there were a lot of interesting talks on um, like sort of the applications of graph neural networks to medicine and to uh, biology. Um, if we take a look at, I don't know if they have some of these up. Uh, I don't think they have a good list of talks. Um, but it's, yeah, there were a lot of interesting talks on so some of them were on like medicine, some of them were on uh, biology, some of them though were on like the methods uh, linking uh, graph neural networks to like category theory or thinking about some of the theoretical issues in graph neural networks, uh, thinking about some of the successful techniques. So one of the successful techniques for constructing graph neural networks are message passing algorithms, uh, but sometimes for some applications that's not sufficient. So you know they they considered like different application domains, and really you know there is a I think a strong push to to apply graph neural networks uh, to uh, biology and some of these other areas. Um, you can do a neural network or deep learning technique um, to solve the tensegrity structures. So oh, okay. I was interested in that. Um, yeah, I don't, well, they, they just talked about graphs. So the idea is that you create these, uh, you uh, use like a data set, an input data set. It could be like a microscopy data set. And you build these graph embeddings from the data. So if you have a bunch of points that represent your features, then you have to infer graphs from that. And the graphs then are evaluated. You can you can do whatever you want with the embeddings. There are also non-embedding approaches. I know this last summer we were using embedding approaches where you 
take the features and you build these graph embeddings, which are just these graphs that are, um, you know, inferred from the data, these graph, you know, how are things related in the data set? Uh, there are other ways of doing it. And I don't know which is uh, most appropriate for that problem or for some of the problems we have. Uh, but I mean, I know like we use the embedding approach and it worked okay, but there may be better approaches. And so I'm going to be preparing a, a blog post on this in the near future to kind of go over some of these things that they talked about. So we'll, yeah, stay tuned for that. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'm, I'm delayed again here. Um, maybe I should, I, I'm going to go that way for a while, okay. uh, for a minute. Right. And I'll, I'll um, turn everything off and hope it speeds up. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess it's not airing anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so this is the YouTube channel, Learning on Graphs, uh, just so we have that. Then they attended the uh, Mimo Devo uh, Symposium, which is Mechanics, Morphogenesis, Development, and Evolution. And this is uh, actually hosted uh, in Paris. Um, uh, so this is the network of people who attended uh, the workshop. This is the Neuroanatomy GitHub. So the Neuroanatomy GitHub, they have a little application that plots out the uh, attendees based on their interests in, into these networks. So Devorm group is here in this group, and then there's another group of people interested in, I don't know what this uh, sub-network is. It's, uh, so, I mean, this is just kind of a cute thing. It's not really for analysis, but some of the things they did at this workshop, uh, really interesting talk. So this was in, took place in Paris. They had like a morning session, which was in person, and then the afternoon session, which was hosted in uh, on, well, it was also in person, but also virtual. So we got to watch it being in the US. I got to get up really early and watch these both days. So uh, really interesting stuff here. Uh, they had some interesting work on mechanical stress as a selective pressure for embryo evolution. Um, they had also some work on plants, so it wasn't just animals. Uh, they had a number of different species, so it was a very, in terms of speci uh, species, it was very diverse. It went from uh, small uh, microbes to uh, like different collective uh, collectives of microbes to yeests to animals of different um, orders, to, uh, uh, you know, plants and different types of plants. So there was all sorts of stuff going on there. Uh, there were a lot of things on mechanics, on blastocyst uh, morphogenesis. Uh, there was some stuff on infl So this was a talk. We talked about inflating things using mechanical or using sort of soft pliable models. They had a talk on inflating to shape. This one was actually, uh, it was basically where there was, a, I guess he was an artist or some sort of sculptor or mechanical engineer. I can't remember. Maybe he did all three. And he built these models that were like these inflatable structures that it would put air into them and they'd inflate. And it would kind of show that process of inflation, how, you know, the, the morphology had to sort of move as it, as it grew or as it changed shape. And so it was really interesting. Did a lot of things with uh, flower petals and things like that. Um, did some things with animal morphology. It was really, really an interesting exercise in showing some of those steps because in some of these earlier talks, they had talked about um, things that you see in the embryo, such as folding and buckling, and whether it's something that is like a uh, process that unfolds through gene expression and is sort of a essential part of uh, morphology and morph morphogenesis or whether it's just something that needs to happen so that uh, morphogenesis can proceed. It's kind of like uh, moving something out of the way to get to a goal. So maybe buckling and folding sometimes serves as a, just a means to an end. 
And so uh, some of these experiments with the uh, balloons, you could actually show whether these things are, you know, uh, sort of mechanically fundamental or not. Uh, there are some things on fly development, which was actually a, a major theme doing things at Drosophila, uh, which was uh, a very nice model system because there's a lot of uh, changes in shape. There's a lot of folding, buckling, or different types of features in the uh, Drosophila embryo that are really good for studying this. Uh, there are also uh, other things, looking at different canal networks and jellyfish, uh, looking at looping network morphogenesis, things like that. So they're in jellyfish, they also provide uh, insights into uh, some network morphogenesis, which is the formation of uh, like nerve networks and other types of uh, phenotypic networks. Uh, and then the second day, there was a lot of interesting stuff on like the uh, the uh, development of the face or the, the, or the human face. They were actually using a human face they were looking at the morphology of the skull and how it changes, and they were using uh, something called anatomical networks. So this is uh, similar to embryo networks in that they take landmarks on the in, on the skull, and as the the skull changes its morphology and development, you can look at the changes in that network, and so you can actually look at the network cross species uh, across uh, just you know different parts of development to see how these things change. And they were actually, I think, looking in this case across primates. So there are some very interesting things in primates that are going on with face uh, shape evolution. Uh, then there were some things about uh, biological shape, eggs, bodies, and beaks. And this talk actually uh, highlighted some of the applications of, uh, of dynamical systems theory, especially uh, Lagrangian coherent structures to some of the uh, developmental trajectories that are occurring in uh, beak development. Uh, shape and propulsion among green algae. So this was where they were looking at algae. Uh, they were looking at very, uh, very small number of cells in these uh, algal colonies and looking at some of the things that are going on with the shape of them and how they use their, you know, small colony size, how they use that shape to to move around their environment. Uh, then there were this uh, modeling organogenesis from biological first principles. So this is more of a theoretical talk. Plant root, uh, plant root growth against mechanical obstacles. So this was kind of an interesting model of how physics, uh, the physics of networks and root networks overcomes uh, different resistances in the environment. Uh, then this one was, of course, on this work on um, yeast. So uh, there's this work that, that's ongoing that look at yeast as sort of a model for the precursors of multicellularity. So uh, yeasts will uh, clump into these groups, into these little clusters, uh, and they do this sort of in a loose association. But over time, if you do experimental evolution experiments, you can get them to form uh, larger clusters that are more tightly associated. And so this is thought to be a model for the origin of multicellularity. And they actually did some really cool biophysics on this, showing some of the, the, the things that maybe are going on in the biophysics that, that might give insights into why this is happening. And then finally, this uh, multicellular matter in the evolution of animal form talk. This was about uh, development and how, you know, there's sort of uh, selection at the level of multicellular multicellularity and, and developmental shape and form. So that was a really interesting set of talks. Um, they, I think those are not, I don't know if they have recorded those, but they're definitely, um, I have some notes from that. So if anyone's interested, uh, I can give you access to those notes. So. Um, can, are they online? Like, did they, are they... Oh. Um, can you go see it? Yeah, I don't think the second one was recorded. I think that was uh, something that oh. is... Yeah, I, I have a lot of notes on it, so... I think the notes might be interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do it justice, of course, but I'm going to do... A, I think I may also do a blog post on that, too, but that might take a while. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to go over some papers.
uh, a couple of topics I'd like to cover. Uh, the first topic is the synthetic biology as a sort of guidepost for developmental biology. So this is uh, a review article in, I think it's in um, Science. And this is a fairly recent article. I believe it was in, uh, yeah, this last past month in November. So this article is uh, Scaling of Complexity in Synthetic Developmental Biology. And uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to use synthetic biology to sort of inform developmental biology. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. So the application of synthetic biology approaches to study development opens the possibility to build and manipulate developmental processes to understand them better. Researchers have reconstituted fundamental developmental processes such as cell patterning and sorting by engineering circuits in vitro. Moreover, new tools have been created that allow for control of developmental processes in more complex organoids and embryos. So some of the stuff we talked about earlier in the meeting on um, you controlling shape using artificial structures, soft active materials, but also some of the things we've talked about in past meetings on organoids and even some embryos. So if you're doing this with uh, genetic control on embryos where you're doing like genetic engineering or even like uh, force, you know, uh, manipulating the forces of the environment of the embryo. These are all synthetic approaches. Synthetic approaches allow testing of which components are sufficient to reproduce a developmental process and under what conditions as well as what effect perturbations have on other processes. So, you know, when you have these model systems, you can look at what's sufficient to reproduce a developmental process. Uh, you know, maybe uh, we don't really know if something is necessary or something is sufficient. We have to test this through an experimental means. And so at least in this case, we can see what components are sufficient. It doesn't mean that they're necessary, but that if they're present, then that's something that is going to have an effect on the system. Um, and so then also when we have a perturbation in development, if that perturbation will have a, a large scale effect or if it's just just has a trivial effect. So a lot of times uh, there are a lot of environmental perturbations, for example, in developmental systems, but developmental systems have a buffering set of buffering mechanisms which make them robust to those shocks. We envision that the future of synthetic developmental biology requires an increase in the diversity of available tools and further efforts to combine multiple developmental processes into one system. So there's no one model system that actually does all these things. We need to go to different model systems and use those as inspiration. So um, one outstanding approach has been the introduction of synthetic gene circuits to reconstitute cell communication and tissue patterning. So uh, for example, there's a minimal symmetry breaking system that's been engineered to reconstitute lateral inhibition based on cell-cell contact their membrane brown lig uh, ligand receptor pair notch, delta and notch. And so this is a classic system in developmental biology where they introduce these uh, membrane brown ligand receptor pairs. Uh, and this constitutes a system where it controls the fate of cells. So you can actually uh, create a little circuit that allows you to switch the states of the cells. And this, this creates symmetry breaking in the embryo. But this is a limited system and it's not something you can do for an entire embryo. Um, so this is something that we, you know, if we want to look at something that's embryo wide or maybe it responds to physical forces, we may need to use another model system. Um, so long range communication mechanisms have been explored to achieve in vitro patterning. One example is morphogen like systems where cells respond in a concentration dependent manner to diffusible signaling molecules. Uh, we've, people will also use reaction diffusion systems, which we've talked about in the meetings. It gives us a better understanding of conditions under which a short-range activation and a long-range inhibitor can generate complex patterns. In these examples, full gene circuits were engineered into cells, so you can't just use the gene circuit as a sort of a, a simple switch. You have to engineer them into cells and use them in, in, as part of the cellular machinery 
showing that the components were used as sufficient uh, used were sufficient to mimic the biological patterning process. Again, this is a sort of a uh, proof of concept where you put this engineered technique into a biological context and you see if it produces the effect that you want. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the mechanism down. It just means that sometimes you can re replicate that thing that you're looking to seeking to reproduce. So this is the figure that I wanted to show. Uh, this is a nice figure that kind of goes over a lot of this, uh, these sorts of things in 2D cell culture. So this is um, an example of some of these different mechanisms and how they're replicated. So A is, uh, let's see, A is lateral inhibition, the symmetry breaking mechanism in inner ear patterning. So this is an example here where you have a two-dimensional uh, cell culture. You have these two different uh, cell states and you have pattern formation. Uh, this is a synthetic symmetry breaking engineered in vitro. So this is outside of the context, again, of the, of the uh, organism, of the body. And you can see that there's symmetry breaking here where a cell divides and you get a different state in the daughter cells. Um, this is uh, cell sorting B, where you get cell sorting in the inner cell mass, and you have synthetic sorting on the right, which is in vitro again, not in the context of a, a developmental body. And you get the same sort of effect where you get an outer ring and then this inner mass of cells. And they're different states, so they're sort of, you have them initially in this sort of random configuration, and then they form this pattern. And for C, you have stripe patterning, so you could do this uh, on the fish's uh, body and their, uh, and their skin, or you can do it in a two-dimensional uh, array where you get this patterning. Uh, D is where you see neural crest migration, and then this is the uh, in, uh, in vitro version where you can actually use optogenetics to migrate the cells. You illuminate the uh, cell, the area, and the cells respond to that elimination stimulus. Uh, you can also do proliferation and apoptosis. This is the classic example of digit formation where cells, you have this sort of mass that comes out, you know, as, as the uh, for for limb and the where the digits are going to form the hand or the paw or whatever it is and whatever organism you're looking at and then uh, you have this pattern cell death where it forms digits so this pad becomes a set of digits by the cell intermediate cells dying off and then the rest of the cells forming these digits and you can do a similar thing in vitro where you can use uh, optogenetic apoptosis so you can program cell death using an optogenetic stimulus. And so these are, these are all the types of things you can do here. You can actually look at epithelial folding as well. This is an example in the tissue where you have neural tube folding and you can use optogenetics again to fold tissues um, in this illuminated area. So it's a stimulus that folds the tissues in this uh, simple sheet of cells. So there are a lot of ways you can do this. And of course, in optogenetics, you need to have a genetically engineered target gene that responds to the optical stimulus. So this is a, a procedure that requires genetic engineering, but also an uh, imaging modality. So this is a nice, another nice uh, uh, figure that shows the engineering and developmental processes in organoids and embryos. This shows some of these things, apical constriction, uh, D -D -D DPP gradient controls wing patterning and growth, so you can have this sort of uh, control of, of molecular gradients. You can have uh, uh, terminal signaling, uh, where you can have the signal and you can remove the signal, and you can see the effect in this uh, gastrulation of this embryo. Um, you can have spatiotemporal control in some of these processes. So this is an example of optogenetics, allowing you uh, control in space and of shape and over time as well, because you do this at a certain point in development. So if you're building a developmental, if you're engineering a developmental model, you want to do these things at a certain time. It's not that you just want to do these things whenever. Um, when uh, you're constructing a phenotype, you want to do these things in a certain order. Um, 
But we can also use apical constriction to alter organoid shape. And these are organoids here, uh, where you have some uh, putative morphogenesis going on. Uh, and you can actually refine some of this by applying some of these techniques to an organoid. So here's an optic vesicle organoid, which has some putative morphogenesis along the edges. And you can actually uh, shrink different parts of the organoid, and you can actually f shape this organoid in ways that you couldn't before. And so neuroactodermal organoids, you have a similar process where you can flatten this, cir this uh, circular morphology. So you can actually form shapes. You can actually encourage morphogenesis and move it along. Um, so this is an interesting review. Uh, the future, perspe uh, future perspectives, of course, the, you have two things here that they point out, combination of developmental processes. So you can combine these different things. You can, for example, combine reaction diffusion patterning and tissue folding. And this is an example from an organoid where you're able to take a circular array of cells, manipulate some of the cells and fold them out. So you form this morphology here and you can actually shape, sculpt morphogenesis out of these very simple models. Uh, but you can also study complex tissues. So you can actually look at a wild type shape of a tissue. You can perturb the shape using optogenetics. And you can actually ask the question, what are the feedbacks here? How does shape get informed by function? As you're using your optogenetic probe, you're actually uh, probing the function of this tissue. So what is the effect of this function on tissue? And it, you can do this in a controlled manner. So this is a very, you know, this is, valuable for both building uh, morphogenesis and probing morphogenesis. Okay, so that's that paper. Um, the second paper set of papers I wanted to talk about are these papers. It's a, the title of this folder is Tug of Wars and Locks. And it's two papers that kind of involve morphogenesis in different ways. Uh, so this paper is a tug of war up to the top here, a tug of war between filament treadmilling and myosin-induced contractility generates actin rings. So this is something called filament treadmilling and myosin-induced contractility, and this generates actin rings. Uh, so this paper, uh, in most eukaryotic cells, actin filaments assemble into a shell-like actin cortex which is a sort of a, a shell of actin under the plasma membrane, controlling cellular morphology, me mechanics, and signaling. So this is something that happens in eukaryotic cells. You get this actin skeleton forming out of filaments, and they form this cortex, which is a surface, a outer surface or outer shell. And so the actin cortex is highly polymorphic, adopting diverse forms such as the ring-like structures found in protosomes, axonal rings, and immune synapses. The biophysical principles that underlie the formation of actin rings and cortices remain elusive. Using, using a molecular simulation platform called Median, we discovered that varying the filament treadmilling rate and myosin concentration induces a finite size phase transition in actin-myosin network structures. We found that actin and myosin networks condense into clusters at low treadmilling rates or high myosin concentration, but form ring-like or cortex-like structures at high treadmilling rates and low myosin con concentration. So this is like something that they're looking at these different, these treadmilling rates and myosin concentration, and they're looking at the sort of shapes that it's, it's uh, the shapes that are being made. This mechanism is supported by our corroborating experiments on live T cells, which exhibit ring-like actin networks upon activation by stimul stimulatory antibody. Upon disruption of filament treadmilling or enhancement of myosin activity, the pre-existing actin rings are disrupted into actin clusters or, and coll or collapse towards the network center, respectively. So this is the structure of this network, and they're looking at different aspects of this filament treadmilling and myosin activity. And so these rings can be disrupted in different ways. They can collapse towards the network center. They can change their uh, morphology and topology. 
Our analyses suggest that the ring-like actin structure is a preferred state of low mechanical energy, which is importantly only reachable at sufficiently high treadmilling rates. So this kind of goes through a lot of this. Uh, talks about ring-like actin geometries that have been found on other subcellular structures, such as potosomes and axons. Uh, so this is something that you see throughout cells. Um, and they do these experiments where they look at this. Um, they use this uh, platform called Median, which is mechanochemical dynamics of active networks and experiments on live T cells. So they're actually doing this in T cells, but they're modeling the <clears throat> actin uh, dynamics in this program. Uh, we find that competition between actin filament treadmilling and myosin contractility determines the overall network morphology. So this is, uh, so, okay, so they do this dissecting and modeling of the T-cell actin ring. Uh, they need to look at the distribution of F-actin in live cells, so they need to parameterize their model. And then once they parameterize their model, they can actually apply it to the, the modeling software. And so this is uh, figure one. This is the uh, actin and MM2 uh, distribution of actin rings and T cells in the simulation. So this is your actin ring. This is your MN2. Uh, and this is the simulation setup. So you have this NM2, you have this actin, these two types of rings, and you put them into the simulation around the edge of the cell. Uh, you have these other uh, things as well. Uh, and then you have this, this is your uh, microscopy image here. You have the outer shell, the inner ring, and then the merged in the merged image. So you're actually stained for these different things. And you see their distribution in the cell. Then you look at the uh, normalized intensity of the signal versus the diameter of the cells. And you get sort of the position of these two rings. And then you can create an animation of the two rings overlapping, but also distinct sort of as an outer and an inner shell. And that's how they kind of build their simulation from these uh, distributions of actin and NM2. So then after that, they're able to build a minimal model for actin ring formation. And so treadmilling is just their movement around in this uh, ring. So they're actually moving around and forming a ring. And these rings are, of course, things that uh, allow the cell to achieve stability. So the next figure shows some of these simulations. They have their minimal model. They're able to measure different things in it, simulate different uh, things in it. They're able to look at the... Um, so NM2 contractility induces geometric collapse of treadmilling actin filaments. Normalized medians of radiofilament density distribution, different treadmilling rates are shown. So these are rates of where they're moving around and they're active. Um, and they show that in some cases this collapses. And I guess an E is where they have a collapse situation. Um, actually, I think in, let's see. So in E, a snapshot of a spherical cortex like network and a slice showing the internal structure, actin filaments or magenta cylinders, we know that. Um, but they show the treadmilling rate uh, is defined as the average number of actin monomers added per filament per second at the barbed ends. So the treadmilling rate is where they're adding in things and they're moving around and so the rate increases as they're adding in actin monomers. Uh, equivalent to the rate of F actin depletion from the pointed ends. So this is actually where they're able to get regeneration of actin filaments. So the actin filaments are added, they degrade, and they have this rate of act activity. So then here's an example of some of this where they have, uh, yeah, so this is treadmilling rates in NM2 concentrations, regulated network structural transition. So this shows us at uh, different rates and some of the simulation results here. And so from that, they can actually ask some questions 
Uh, one are the energetic origins of structural polymorphism in these active networks. So they can actually look at, so now they're exploring the chemical and mechanical properties of actin networks at various treadmilling rates. We found the numbers of F-actin filaments, bound linkers, and bound motors are nearly constant across different uh, values for this parameter, while distribution of diffusive molecules such as G-actin and nucleators also did not show spatial location being uniformly distributed throughout the simulation volume. Uh, this observation suggests that ring-like architectures do not form because of the enrichment of soluble constituent molecules near the periphery. So this is uh, where ring-like architectures don't form because the soluble constituent molecules are enriched near the periphery. In other words, that ring doesn't grow in volume or in number of molecules. Uh, so it's, it's moving around this ring and it's not necessarily dependent on its density. Uh, the lack of enrichment of soluble molecules in the periphery suggested the possible energetic origin of these structures. We thus examine the mechanical energy of the system, which primarily arises from filament bending in our simulation. For fixed concentrations of NM2 and crosslinker, we found that this parameter decreases with increasing R sub uh, TM. In addition, EMEC undergoes a sharp reduction where R sub TM reaches the critical threshold with the UMEC of actin rings being two to three fold lower than that of clusters. So if you go back to this figure up here, they show that you have these rings, but also clusters. This is, I think, here where you have inhibition. So you have no inhibition, and this is over time. This is before inhibition, after inhibition. Uh, this is no inhibition for this. Uh, I guess there's a, uh, a chemical treatment that they do here where it's, you know, nothing weak and strong. And then this is uh, before the treatment and after the treatment. So this is uh, before the treatment in 800 seconds for the vehicle, after the treatment of the vehicle, which doesn't have any effect. The weak inhibition, which is a low concentration of lat A, before the treatment, and you have this ring, and then you start to get the ring starts to sort of collapse down. You don't see very much of an effect, though. And then for strong inhibition, this ring forms, or the ring is formed, as it is in the other examples. And then the ring really starts to break down after it's after this treatment of LAT-A. So this is a strong dose of LAT-A. And it forms these clusters instead of this ring. So the ring actually can collapse down into clusters. And so that's what they're talking about when they talk about clusters. And so the idea is, do you want, you know, it, in the ring condition, it provides this structural integrity in the cluster condition it provides, um, does not provide that. Um, so uh, since higher R median indicates localization of actin filaments at the network periphery, this negative correlation indicates that configurations with the lowest mechanical energy are those of the ring-like geometry. So that's the, the lowest mechanical energy state. And these clusters are higher level uh, uh, mechanical energy states. These results suggest that the peripheral arrangement of actin filaments is more energetically favorable than more distorted configurations found in centripetal clusters, which are these clusters that are um, uh, moving outward towards the ring. Uh, so then this detailed mechanical modeling in this platform shows that active actin networks exhibit a striking morphological transition upon changes in the filament treadmilling rate. We found two distinct types of dynamic structures due to the interplay of treadmilling and NM2 contractility in the initially disordered network. One, actin clusters formed in slow treadmilling or high CNM2 networks. So this is the treatment of this drug and it replicated this condition. And two, ring-like and cortex-like structures spontaneously assembled in fast treadmilling on the CNM2 networks. So these ring-like structures are cortex on the outside of the cell uh, or in the, uh, on the outer edge of the cell uh, resulted from number two. This geometric transition does not require filament tethering to the boundary or a spatially biased filament assembly. So critically, this ring isn't the product of uh, self-organization. I guess it's self-organization, but it's based on energetics, not on any sort of uh, spatial organization or some sort of 
uh, pious in the uh, in the, its position. So we're we're a physical mechanism that tethers it to the the edge. We also observed a sharp transition in the system's mechanical energy during the transformation from a multi-cluster network to a ring architecture. So this sharp change in morphology and um, These mechanisms are not well understood. In this work, they examine the impact of actin filament treadmilling and meiosin contractility on actin structure. Although the results from the simulation are quantitatively in agreement with experiments, some of the limitations of the model are um, so these simulations, although they agree with experiments and cells, there are some limitations. So one limitation is that they did not explicitly include a few significant properties of actin networks. So they can only include some of the uh, mechanisms, but not others, and that may have an effect on the results that they have. Um, since both the ring and cluster states have lower structural entropy, we believe driving for the driving force for actin ring formation is energetic. However, we need more work to quantitatively estimate the entropic contribution to these networks and their self-organization. So we don't have a full accounting of the energetics of these networks. So this is uh, something that needs to be uh, confirmed with future empirical studies. And so that's pretty much it. This paper is a interesting foray into the world of actin networks and minimal models and things like that. So the second paper is on an actin-based vistoplastic lock ensures progressive body axis elongation. So this is something we've talked about in terms of, you know, how do we get these different processes and how do we keep them in place? I mean, you know, uh, obviously development occurs in steps, uh, but what is the sort of, how do these things get locked into place so that the next process can unfold? So the abstract here reads, body axis elongation constitutes a key step in animal development, laying out a the final form of the entire animal. It relies on the interplay between intrinsic forces generated by molecular motors, extrinsic forces exerted by adjacent cells, and mechanical resistance forces due to tissue elasticity or friction. Understanding how mechanical forces influence morphogenesis at the cellular and molecular level remains a challenge. Recent work has outlined how small incremental steps towards power cell autonomous epithelial shape changes, which suggests the existence of specific mechanisms that stabilize cell shape change and counteract cell elasticity. So this is uh, uh, so this is a recent work here that they're reviewing, um, and they're and they're engaging with uh, how is outlined how small incremental steps uh, power, meaning that they influence cell autonomous epithelial shape change. So you have the cell autonomous uh, shape change mechanism. This thing suggests an existence of specific mechanisms that stabilize cell shapes and counteract cell elasticity. So this is this lock that they're talking about. Uh, beyond the twofold stage of, of an embryo, embryonic elongation in, in C. elegans, and so we're using the C. elegans model, is dependent on both muscle activity and the epidermis. The tension generated by muscle activity triggers a mechanotransduction pathway in the epidermis that promotes axis elongation. So this is at a, uh, a stage of development where you have this uh, axis in the embryo and how it's um, moving outward. So you start with a, a two-cell embryo and C. elegans. And that establishes polarity. So it's basic polarity here. So this is A, B, and P1. And then as you get cell division, of course, you start to get elongation along these two axes. So P1 is down here, A, B is here. And we know the sort of these sublineages. So these, uh, these cells form a, a, a cell lineage 
and AB forms a cell lineage, P1 forms a cell lineage, and they tend to be in these two sides of the embryo, the anterior and the posterior end. And then there's this elongation that happens uh, within the embryo to pull it apart so that it's elongated. So eventually you get like a comma stage or something like this, and a pretzel stage where the worm is kind of in a pretzel. And then finally, it's like this sort of spiral shaped morphology that will hatch into a larva. And the larva, of course, is fully elongated and running around and behaving with muscles and everything. The muscles start to form and the epidermis start to form around maybe in the comma stage. But th what they're arguing is that this polarity starts early and continues out. And these mechanisms pull the embryo in these different uh, directions. So this is how we get polarity. This is how we maintain polarity. This is how we maintain the structure for uh, future changes. Um, so the tension generated by muscle activity triggers a mechanotransduction pathway. So in the, each cell, there's a mechanotransduction pathway that occurs, and it reinforces these, these uh, physical uh, stimuli. Here we identify a network that stabilizes cell shapes in C. elegans embryos at a stage that involves non-autonomous mechanical interactions between epithelial and contractile cells. We search for factors genetically or molecularly interacting with the P21 activating kinase homolog PAC1 and acting in this pathway, thereby identifying the alpha spectrum SPC1. And this is a lot of molecular biology here. So uh, combined absence of PAC1 and SPC1 induced complete axis retraction owing to defective epidermal actin stress fiber. Uh, modeling predicts that a mechanical vistoplastic deformation process can account for embryo shape stabilization. Molecular analysis suggests that cellular basis for vis viscoplasticity originates from progressive shortening of epidermal microfilaments that are induced by muscle contractions relayed by actin severing proteins and from foramen homology 2 domain containing protein 1 or FHOD1 foramen bundling. Our work thus identifies an essential molecular lock acting in a developmental ratchet-like process. So this is a sort of a, a ratchet and a lock model, which is of course where if you have a ratchet, you move it forward and it moves your bolt. Maybe if you have it on a ratchet on like a bolt or something like that, it moves it in one direction. And then there's a lock so that it doesn't move back in the other direction when you move the ratchet back to make another turn. So ratchets are kind of, they exert forces in one direction and then in order to get the ratchet back to its starting point to make the next tightening you need to move it back but of course it needs to lock in place in order to do that so that's the the um the an analogy they're using here and so this is then in c elegans so we have this we just showed the different stages of the embryo and how these things are unfolding this, these are the needs for forces to, to elongate the embryo and to uh, contribute to changes in shape. Um, so there's this retraction phenotype. Uh, so they have, we conclude that mechanical input provided by muscles to the epidermis induces the retraction phenotype observed in SPC1, PAC, PAK1 double mutants. So you can actually have... Um, this, this uh, mechanism can vary based on the mutant that you're looking at. So in C. elegans, we have defined mutants. Um, we can actually look at some of these things with SPC1 and PAC1 mutants. We can look at how these embryos... So in these double mutants, or actually, yes, in these double mutants, embryos could reach about 65 microns at a slow rate, but then fail to maintain their shape and retract it back to about 50 microns. So looking at the length of the embryo, this, this uh, uh, elongation here, what they're saying is that in these double mutants, you get a elongation to 65 microns and then back down to 50 microns. So it actually loses its elongation over time. And so this is a product of the different uh, molecular mechanisms that are going on in these mutants. Um, 
Because muscles are tightly mechanically coupled to the epidermis, through epidermal hemidemosomes, uh, their contractions also displace the epidermis. So this is what allows for this, uh, this uh, shape change. And so there's this stretching that occurs, and this uh, ratchet, ratcheting mechanism is to maintain the ability to maintain this stretching outward. And so th in, these, in these double mutants, you don't have this lock on the ratchet. Uh, so a simple hypothesis would be that some mechanism stabilizes the transient cell shapes induced by muscle activity. For example, during drosophila gastrulation and germ band extension, which is in drosophila embryos, a similar process to this. And in fact, drosophila embryos have a longer germ than C. elegans by far. And so they do this, uh, this sort of stretching process. Um, uh, ectomyosin pulsatile flows are thought to be progressively modified junctions, or thought to progressively modify junctions. To uncover such a mechanism in C. elegans, we focused on the kinase PAC1, so this is actually something that's mediating mechanotransduction anyways and regulating myosin 2, which is the uh, muscular aspect here. Um, so this is something that uh, we can see in the embryo. So this is the embryo that they're looking at here. Um, this is where it's stretched out and uh, this is an example here of, in I guess in the comma stage here, um, where you get the stretching, this elongation, and you get these muscle contractions that they're measuring here. All right, so in this figure, we can see a model um, in F. We have a cellular model of embryo elongation based on volume conservation in normal embryos. So this is a, a case where you're looking at volume conservation. You're looking at the activity of PAC1 and SPC1, this actin binding protein. So during contraction, for example, in the wild type, you get this activity here and contraction. So you can see them being pushed together and relaxation, they're not being pushed together. And so this is normal remodeling. Uh, in effective remodeling in these double mutants, you have this uh, action of contraction and then this action of relaxation and during relaxation these filaments break down here so that there there's this defective remodeling that occurs and doesn't really uh, stay in place these these in this case relaxation means that they lock in place in the defective remodeling and relaxation they actually everything actually relaxes and there's no tension in, formed to uh, maintain this change so that's that's another uh, example. Um, an actin remodeling network providing mechanical plasticity ensures embryo elongation. Uh, this is uh, figure four. This shows a, sp uh, a spring model of what's going on here. Here's a plastic spring. Spring and dash pot model is what they call this. So the dash pot is here, the spring is here. Um, and this kind of shows the forces of the epidermis and muscles acting on this plastic spring and then that's so that's how they model the spring and dash using a spring and dash pot uh, model and then this d here shows some of these mutants in the lima bean lima bean stage the lima bean plus 130 minutes and the lima bean plus 220 minutes and so as you can see this is what happens in these different mutants uh, and it's fhod1 spc1 mutant uh, it's actually treated with SPC1 is treated with RNAi, so it's interfering with that uh, gene, the expression of that gene, and you can see that it has this sort of it achieves a comma period at a plus 130 minutes, this, and then it goes back to this shape here. And this one SPC1 with RNAi, it achieves the comma, but it kind of maintains it. In this case, it, it sort of maintains it a little bit. In this case, it may, doesn't maintain it very well. And so you can see that how this interferes in different ways. Uh, sometimes it maintains the shape, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it reverts back to the original shape. So, uh, yeah, this is, um, okay. And so in conclusion, um, you know, they're they're kind of investigating the different factors that might 
involve a breakdown of this ratchet mechanism. So um, some of it involves the failure of actin bundling and things like that. Um, there's also activation of the muscle-induced mechanotransduction pathway could be affected. Um, we conclude that actin filament severing initiated by muscle contractions following by FHOD one dependent bundling or capping represents a ratchet-like mechanism, providing a molecular basis for vistoplasticity. And so we don't know all the factors, but we know from these experiments that there are some mutants that ex don't exhibit this sort of ratcheting process. And some of our results identify several proteins that are involved in stabilizing cell shapes in a system subjected to repeated external mechanical stress. We propose that the progressive shortening of actin filaments under the control of these factors mediates a cellular vistoplastic process or promotes a axis elongation. A similar vistoplastic process might operate in vertebrate tissues comprising an epithelial layer surrounded by a contractile layer. So in vertebrate tissues, there might be some sort of process where you have an epithelial layer um, and then in, in the middle and then a contractile layer on the top something like internal organs in humans. So this could actually be like a composite version of this, which we see in C. elegans, where there's uh, different types of uh, contraction and uh, growth. So such a process might therefore also influence the metast uh, metastatic properties of tumor cells juxtaposed with contractile cells. So again, we, have, we would have these uh, multiple layers of cell where you would have something like uh, sort of like this here, sort of by an outer layer. So we're talking about um, an epithelial layer in the middle and a contractile layer outside. So the contractile layer would be out here. This would be the epithelial layer. And so this would be like a, something where you might be able to control this epithelial mass inside of it, squeeze it, or, you know, control the shape of it in some way. So they're suggesting that this is something that happens in metastatic cancers where, there's, um, uh, where the tumor metastasizes. And so uh, that, that's how they're uh, thinking about that. All I wanted to talk about in terms of those papers. I hope you learned something. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's. I think that's all I have for today. Um, unless you have anything else you want to mention. Anyway, no, that's that's all. I'm trying to get to the bottom of how to um, analyze tensegrity structures, and uh, well, we'll keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Somebody did it. Obviously, they just weren't very clear with their paper. Yeah, uh, on yeah. how they they um, accomplished it. They weren't telling me the obvious things, and uh, I need obvious things pointed out to me because um, I'm a beginner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just don't know where they got their information from. <laughs> That's always the thing to keep in mind, though, with like engineering and some science is that. They make assumptions in the paper, and then they don't tell you what those assumptions are. So you always have to think about, like, you know, is this is this the only way it can be done, or are they just kind of throwing in something as an example? But sometimes people just don't make that clear. It's like, we'll just assume this, and then, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, they need what you call a Rosetta Stone some yeah, days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes they put it in a... In a an appendix, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, this, yeah, this is the last meeting of the year, so we'll be back in January. Uh, probably, okay. uh, I don't know what date, but that first, not the first Monday, but the second Monday, probably. Second Monday. Okay, well, um, have a good holiday. You too. Have a good holiday. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye.